Today, we will present psychoanalysis as politics aspiring to think in the age of anti-thinking. This podcast discusses the political nature of psychoanalytic audacity in our era of fake news and disinformation. Today, gullible populations accustom themselves to the lies and misrepresentations of anti-thinking, often through the rumor mills of social media where any and every thought, no matter how bizarre, is leveled to an equality of consideration. Ian Miller is a clinical psychologist, psychoanalyst and writer based in Dublin. His most recent book is Clinical Spinoza, integrating his philosophy with contemporary therapeutic practice. He is author of the book Defining Psychoanalysis, Achieving a Vernacular Expression, the author of On Minding and Being Minded, Experiencing Beyond and Beckett, and the co-author of Beckett and Beyond, The Impatient Voice in Psychotherapy and Literature as well as the author of On the Daily Work of Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy. He serves as an associate editor of the American Journal of Psychoanalysis. My name is Gabriela Rullón with Talks on Psychoanalysis, the podcast devoted to current topics on psychoanalysis worldwide, featuring the voices of the original authors. This podcast series published by the International Psychoanalytical Association, is part of the activities of the IPA Communication Committee and is produced by the IPA Podcast Editorial Team. The head of the podcast editorial team is Gaetano Pellegrini and the editing and post-production by Massimiliano Guerrieri. To stay informed about the latest podcast releases, please sign up today. This podcast discusses the political nature of psychoanalytic audacity in our era of fake news and disinformation. Today, gullible populations accustom themselves to the lies and misrepresentations of anti-thinking, often through the rumor mills of social media, where any and every thought, no matter how bizarre, is leveled to an equality of consideration. Opposed to this flattening of critical meaning is the psychoanalytic model of enlightenment, through mobilization of creative thinking. Freud, in jokes in their relation to the unconscious, suggests the framework for such understanding. First, we register forceful immediacy in the play and contrast of ideas. Next, this contrast forces an attack upon our prior sense of coherence. Through such intentional effort, paired with the ability to tolerate uncertainty, we discover with Freud that there is an aspect of truth in this destabilization. This glimmer of truth represents a gaining of consequence from this consciousness of what seems materially to be relative nothingness. Of course, Freud describes the humorous action of jokes, but the general process he articulates is illumination fundamental to psychoanalytic psychotherapy and beyond psychotherapy to our registration of political events. Freud's intentional action is aspirational. It's a fusion of our fundamental human strivings, recognized in modern psychology from the 17th century. This is what D.W. Winnicott terms a going-on being, which is mobilized psychically in conjunction with imagination and reflective thought, extended as action into the external world of objects, people, things, and social situations. The optimization of such enlightenment is central to W.R. Beyond's psychoanalytic conception of thinking. But first must come the difficult transit from bewilderment to enlightenment, as precipitated in what Beyond calls the emotional storm of psychotherapy, the experiential process of interpersonal relations precisely originated by Freud. This model of thinking, together with its inherent difficulties in bearing doubt and uncertainty, is echoed by philosopher John Dewey, who writes, Reflective thinking 
is always more or less troublesome because it involves overcoming the inertia that inclines one to accept suggestions at their face value. It involves willingness to endure a condition of mental unrest and disturbance. Reflective thinking, in short, means judgment suspended during further inquiry, and suspense is likely to be somewhat painful. Culturally, this idea has never been easily accepted. Ethicist Martha Nussbaum remarks on societally widely held and reductive anti-humanistic views that portray the human being as a mere mechanism. Appealing to our desire for the quick fix, for the easy answer, an aspect of human behavior noted early in the history of psychology by Baruch Spinoza and strongly represented psychoanalytically by W.R. Beyond's recognition of the gaps in our knowledge and understanding that are filled by cognitive emotional distortion. Such distortions dispel awareness of our genuine ignorance, both of the causes of our mental functioning and in relation to the world around us. Against this, as Nussbaum recognizes, the psychoanalytic imperative to a painful, difficult sort of self-knowledge is one that most today would rather dismiss. Regarding the psychoanalytic imperative to wrest clarity from the cunningly wrought hiding places of human ignorance, Nussbaum casts psychoanalysis as a noble humanistic discipline that gets at the questions of life and limitation at the right level of depth. For that reason, it's bound to be unfashionable. From the beginnings of modern psychology 400 years ago, we've attended to the multiple functions and outcomes of thought necessarily encountered in the hard work of striving toward clear thinking. From Spinoza to beyond, we've observed the terrifying fact of our human ignorance against which we marshal our will and desire and self-delusion, filling the gaps in our uncertainty at the price of unexamined distortion. Communicative language, too, is equivocal in its meanings, heightened by imperfect verbalization and imperfect reception. The generalization of the stumbling block is captured by Samuel Beckett in his novel, How It Is, as ill-spoken, ill-heard, ill-remembered, ill-murmured. Each of these domains is amplified by the selective concrescences of memory that necessarily limit the fully subjective fact of experience, especially as such conjunctions of perception, conception, feeling states of mind, imagination, or reflective reason are dredged from long past moments in our development, closed off in our memory as if they were singular events, unlike the ongoing flux of the complicated psychological situations onto which they are now mobilized and projected, as we see clinically in the processes of transference. Additionally, as Spinoza observed 350 years ago, what we take to be true in daily life is rarely clear and distinct, but compounded of common opinion and hearsay, as well as what we have learned culturally. Only rarely do we experience, and even more rarely attend, to the intuitive leaps of understanding, which cloudily may contain the kernel of what Beckett terms how it is, a momentarily clear apprehension of our psychological condition. The problem of anti-thinking supercharges the treacherous currents of these largely unexamined obstacles to clear thinking, upon which prudent action depends. Encouraged by our current toleration of truth, distorted by manipulative opinion, what philosopher Harry Frankfurt terms bullshit, as reflected in the questioning of impossibly whole truths conveyed in our 24-7 news cycles, such that the partiality of conveyance is condemned as fake news. Interestingly, this wholesale negation is the only indication of the necessary psychological operation of doubt instrumental to clear thinking, reflected in the current attack upon reason. Tellingly, it's an assertion of negation that undoes doubt itself. As philosopher of science Bruno Latour reflects, the nature of scientific discovery is always partial and subject within the rigorous applications of method to exactly the transformations that psychoanalysts recognize as transitory or transitional. Progression forward entails inquiry, and fundamental to inquiry is the affirmative potential of doubting. Nevertheless, arrivals at aggregated nuggets of approximate truth provide the thinker with a platform of conceptual plausibility. However, under the damning label fake news, or the heightening of the notion that transitory understandings of scientific data are not final and complete, 
we derogate the open-ended facts of scientific progression, indicative of solid direction, if cloudy in their complex, always cautious uncertainties. So doing, we arrive at our current societal consensus that the careful application of thinking toward the clarification of knotty problems, as well as their distortions, is pointless. Instead, why not follow the simpler path of negation, reducing the world to a primitive certainty of yes or no? In this sense, anti-thinking is a regressive societal undoing, the tolerated obfuscation and aggressive reversal of a previous social assumption or consensual agreement operating progressively for hundreds of years since the dawn of the Enlightenment, which of course also coexisted with the dawn of technological applications drawn from scientific principles and the rise of what today we view as colonialism and extractive capitalism. With this reversal, we relegate what was once central to that which is first peripheral and next uncanny until we reduce it to nothing at all, to no thing. Under such process, we negate the humanity of all who represent what once was, as socially and unfortunately, given the histories of the 20th and 21st century, physically defined out of existence. Its first step, according to writer Jean and Marie, quote, must be the unqualified recognition that the verdict of the social group is a given reality, unquote. Beyond this first step, ensuing catastrophic social events, which for the past century and continuing today have featured the technological adaptations of science to human destruction, including mass murder, torture, and every form of societally inflicted humiliation and injury, developing into atrocities, having, quote, no objective character, unquote, but only their descriptive collapse into what Amery terms chains of physical events, describable in the formalized language of the natural sciences. The significant fact discerned from this unthinkable social historical convergence is this, that according to Amery, a crime causes disquiet in society, but as soon as public consciousness loses the memory of the crime, the disquiet also disappears. We have all witnessed unthinkable headlines of political deception, murderous wars, attacks on basic human rights, and witnessed too over time the wearying nature of these headlines as we adapt to multiple iterations of what we not so jokingly call the new normal, exactly like that old high school science experiment in which the frog, accommodating the rise in temperature of the water in which he swims, boils to death. Of course, in the face of anti-thinking is structuralizing denial. Our precarious experiment is toward planetary destruction through climate change. Psychoanalysis also corroborates Amery's literary observations in the intergenerational transmission of trauma. Here, what is unspeakable becomes unnameable, and what has become unnameable becomes unthinkable. This, too, is a reversal of enlightenment first in the prohibition to use expressive language, then in the forced inaccessibility of experiential fact, and then in our loss of the compass points of thinking. Three positions are possible in light of such development. The first is that we accommodate. The second is that we turn away. And the third is that we question provocatively. Each is a methodological avenue of aspirational endeavor. Each is a form of political action. However, only the methodological practice of inquiry is central to the work of the psychoanalyst. The aspirational goal of psychoanalysis mobilizes our capability for clear thinking. This is reflected both in our psychoanalytic method and through psychoanalytic observations. In our times, such practices assume the nature of political action. The pivot point of inquiry is doubt mobilized in psychoanalysis toward the induction of questioning. Doubt reveals its utility in aiding us to broaden our horizons of thought. By contrast, doubt under the tyranny of anti-thinking is taken as proof of foreclosure, eliminating the vacillation or ambivalence, which is a necessary dimension of reflective thinking, under the authoritarian demand that something is or is not, reducing the fact of doubt which may be society's last great hope. Since the dawn of enlightenment, 
The continuing legacy of psychoanalysis has been well put in the conjunction of two philosophers' watchwords. Immanuel Kant urges us always to question the Latin sapere alde, and Baruch Spinoza reminds us of the necessity under such bold practice of caution, the Latin caute. Cautious methodological inquiry remains the signature of psychoanalytic method, and in our times, countering the fashionable legitimation of anti-thinking, supercharging our basic human software of defensive distortion in thought and action, psychoanalytic method is political action.